you mentioned rambling around. Uh, you do move over to Sabco, but the success mm -hmm. doesn't come as easily as it seemed to earlier in your career. Did you consider that just part of the process of building a new team, or were you frustrated and disappointed maybe with how things work out? Well, I mean, it's like you're always going to be frustrated when, you, when you're when you used to being able to be successful. And here again, this is where one of life's lesson is, is that sometimes, you know, what you've got doesn't allow you to be that successful. You know, sometimes you make a decision to um, – to better yourself, and not always can you better yourself. You you do the best you can, and uh, unfortunately, I'd been with two drivers that were almost like automatic about getting to victory lane, yeah. and then you get a driver, and, and again, no, no, just not knocking Kenny any way, shape, or form. I love Kenny Wallace. When people understand it, I love Kenny Wallace, but he was still young and he was still developing. So, Jeff, you did go back and work with Daryl again in 1996 and 97. After enjoying the kind of success that you'd had with him, what were those years like for you? Uh, they were good uh, but difficult. Okay. I mean, it was still – unfortunately, I've never worked with somebody in the latter part of their career and dealing with some of the things that he was dealing with as – you know, it was – I'm going to use the term, it was time. Yeah. You know, and it happens to everybody. I mean, you know, Richard Petty, Pearson, Yarborough, all the greats. I mean, you know, it, it's – you lose that little bit of hand and eye coordination and that little bit more part of uh, the will to lay it all out there on the line. And, and, it, and it was just catching up with him. So, you know, we tried to capture some uh, magic, and we, we did the best we could. And – other than that, I mean, it was um, – it's always good whenever you can um, come back and get a little more peace of mind than maybe when you left the first time or the second time. <laughs> it's, it's, we laugh about it. We, we are one of those couples as far as a crew chief driver relationship that we've been married, divorced, married, divorced <laughs> several times. Yeah. But, um, no, it, it, was, uh, it was good to be around him and work with him, you know, late in his career. Would have liked to have hit for it to have ended on a different note. Uh, you know, we tried to pull that, you know, during his 25th anniversary uh, deal. But he, he wanted to hang on. He wanted to hang on. Is that something that you talked to him about? Well, I mean, that was kind of like the reason why we went to all of what we did and okay. coming up with the ideas of the cars and everything that was kind of the silver car that we ran. And, you know, it was part of the silver anniversary. You know, just uh, – it seemed logical, and it, it, we were trying to, uh, you know, make it a fond farewell, memorable deal. And unfortunately, you know, the wheel come off the wagon. All right. At what point did television come into the picture for you? Um, you know, I was working for Jack Roush at the time. I had worked for Chad Little, and uh, this, you know, in the last part of my career, you know, worked the last uh, seven races. Uh, with Kurt Busch. And the interim of, I guess it would have been 2000, the deal with Fox was coming together. They made the announcement about uh, hiring Daryl Walter. And then I get a call from, from Daryl saying, you know, you, you ought to take a look at this. Okay. Um, got a couple names and, you know, made phone calls and they said, well, look, you know, we, we, you know, you haven't done anything major TV work or anything. So we, uh, we'd like to get you to come do, you know, some trial runs with us. At that time I went to Jack, you know, who I was working for cause they wanted me to, uh, do something during the 500 at Charlotte, you know, and call a live race, you know, with, with a couple of people and, See how I did. So Jack told me, he said, look, he said, you know, if they're coming in, they're wanting to do all this right here, I think it'll be a great opportunity for you. I understand completely. He said, I wanted to move you into a different role 
the following year anyway, whenever Kirk came on board, he wanted to bring his cup, I mean, his uh, truck crew chief up and keep those two together because they had a really successful run. I said, cool with me. Yeah, I said, that'd be fine. He said, so you just understand, you go do this deal and it don't work, you come back, I'll find you a manager's role. So that gave me some level of comfort and uh, confidence in what I was doing. And <coughs> Excuse me. Went and did the audition. Got a call back saying that they were interested in another audition. And this time I did an audition with Daryl and a series of, I mean, a series of potential hosts, all of them that went through, uh, including, uh, oh, shoot, Rick Allen. That's not Whitney's real name when I first met him, but <laughs> uh, he even, they even tried Rick Allen as a host. And all honesty, we, we did, I think it was seven or eight that day, and Fox didn't like any of them. So... They decided we we're going to do this pre-race deal, and I was going to work with Daryl, and they were going to have a location for us, which wound up being the infield uh, television booth at Daytona, and subsequently what wound up being named the Hollywood Hotel, which was a, a mobile studio that had an elevator on it, as you call it, or a scissor lift type deal. Yeah. But the interesting part about this thing is um, Mr. Hill, David Hill, who was in charge of everything at Fox at that time, brought in Chris Myers. And anybody that watches, you know, Fox NFL, you know, Chris is one of their main players when it comes to uh, broadcasting football as well as some of their other shows that he does. And he knew nothing about racing. And he, we met for the first time in Daytona, that first broadcast. <laughs> and wow. he said, guys, he said, I'm just going to let you know, I'm the dummy in the room. Educate me. Make sure you talk to me on a level that I can understand and every grandma across the country can, you know, communicate with and understand the same thing. So that's kind of how we approached it. He just took care of all the traffic and asking the right questions at the right time. And the rest is history. You go into that race and up until the last half mile of the race – I mean, it's it's a pretty good event. Yeah. Um, and as long as you had known Dale, what was that moment like for you personally to be in a new job, relatively unfamiliar with it, but all of a sudden you are in the middle of the biggest news story that NASCAR has seen in a long, long time? I guess the best way to say to sum it up, but gut wrenching and nauseating at the same time. Uh, I've seen enough fatalities in this sport yeah. to get a pretty good assessment that this was not going to end well. Um, with with every passing minute, you know, it got worse and worse and worse. And you did not know whether to show emotion of sorrow or joy because you were hoping that was some kind of miracle was getting ready to happen. And it didn't. Um, I don't know. It, it's just you go from the highest of highs. I mean, it's and to, to hitting rock bottom. I think that was uh, – it's not the toughest thing I ever went through, but damn close to it because, you know, you just the, – the question is, you know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Because it didn't look as bad as I've seen some of them happen. I mean, I'm standing there at Bristol – when Michael Walter crashes, I watch that car disintegrate. I know there's nothing but little bitty heat pieces of him. Yeah. And you get up there, you know, Daryl's telling me, my brother's dead, my brother's dead, go, go check on, go check on, see how bad it is. It's like, I don't want to go, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like saying I don't want to go. And I get up there and 
when I stopped, Daryl runs over me because he didn't want to go. He just didn't want to go first. And there's Michael afterwards. So, you know, you know, you believe in miracles. And I'm hoping for that same kind of miracle. And it, and it doesn't happen. I mean, a lot of people don't even probably remember this, but I picked Michael Walter to win that race that day. My first television show, and I picked my, Michael Walter to win the Daytona 500 because I liked what I saw that that week. I liked, you know, talking about Dale. I mean, his, his bounce and his step, you know, coming back from the 24 hours of Daytona was, wow. I mean, Earnhardt acts like he's 20 years younger than what he is. The confidence of the team, Slugger Labby, Michael, I mean, it was like, we're 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 gonna do it today. We're gonna break our break our streak. And I picked him to win. And, and you know you couldn't get excited about that. I should have been able to, and I couldn't. So shocking is probably the simplest way to kind of bring it all together right there at the end. You know, it just became shocking. You were in that booth for a lot of years, and a lot of new generation fans, new school fans, mm -hmm. know Jeff Hammond from the Hollywood Hotel. How would you like for race fans to remember you one day? That's a real good question because uh, it, when you put it to me like that, it seems so final. And um, one day, a long time in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like I say, it's uh, it's a long way behind and not very far in the future. Uh, I think the easiest way to put it, Rick, is I, I genuinely love the sport. I mean, I love racing. I love so much about the good stuff in it. And hate so much about the bad stuff is still in it. Um, I know with the limited, I mean, here recently my races have gotten less and less actively going to the racetrack. This past year working in the truck series rejuvenated me quite a bit because I'm, I'm scared of the technology that's come into the sport since I've left it and I, I didn't know how it'd fit in. But at the end of the day, I felt satisfied that I could hold my own and understand enough to be helpful. And for that reason, here again, I'm, I'm back feeling satisfied and gratified. I just, I enjoy watching the whole, the whole game is played from start to finish. It's just... You know, just a few minutes ago, I'm out there unloading a truck that's getting ready to be put together to go to Daytona and helping, you know, get the all the parts and pieces in the right place to make it happen, to have that kind of a value, that kind of um, need. If somebody needs you help to get it done. So once again, I'm looking forward to the next year and the next challenge. And at the same time, I love... Uh, what I still have opportunities to do from broadcasting with PRN, Sirius XM Radio, going to Indianapolis and helping call the races at the Brickyard for their network. Um, it's just staying in and close to the game is, is I'll go. I guess I guess I say the easiest thing that is it, it continues to give me energy and purpose. So I think really, again, to sum it up, I just want to know that I loved racing. I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of it. I've lived it, and I still love it. Love it bad. <laughs>